This is a noisy podcast, a podcast about noise, how we make and use noise and sound in rituals and in celebrations and in protest. It's a rumpum scrumpum reveling in the sound of celebration. This is an expressive noise, the sound we hear at weddings, birthdays, sports matches, funerals, and the noise we make at protests and demonstrations. Noise is at the heart of how we celebrate, part of what historian David Cressy calls the vocabulary of celebration. The firing of cannons, the banging of pots and pans, blowing horns and shaking rattles, the blare of an outdoor band, the percussion of fireworks and the roar of the bonfire, all of these are sounds that help us mark the seasons, special times and special places. A noise is at the heart not just of how we celebrate, but also of the debates and arguments over who we are and how we should behave or misbehave. We can hear this delight in sound in three passages. The first is about Guy Fawkes Night in 1860 and from the Penny Illustrated paper. An extraordinary demonstration was made by the fire brigade. A procession started from the chief fire station in Watling Street. In front were some firemen wearing helmets, dressed in their usual uniform and carrying branches of the engines in their hands. By repeated blowing through the pipes, they made a noise such as that which was heard at Bartholomew Fair. They were playing the fire hoses like giant trumpets. The second is an account of the last tram from Woolwich in 1952 in the Manchester Guardian. The journey from Woolwich to New Cross of the last tram was incomparable. Imagine a crowd along a route and give it torn flamboyant hats and ribbons, football rattles, tin trumpets, dustbin drums and scrubbing board drums, reel and tin tray cymbals, piano accordions and a welter of whistles. The third is Charles Dibden's description of another bonfire night, this time in Lincoln in 1788. There were bells, kettles, horns, hollowing, hooping, huzzaying by men, women and children. It was the 5th of November and the mob were carrying about a figure of Guy Fawkes. Noise is a scary fire. It frightens off bad energies and is a key part of the ritual of exorcism what Mercia Elaide calls the anti-demonic magic of noise. A noise summons good energy, and this is the key to its widespread use in ceremony. Where I live in Somerset, shotguns explode to keep off evil spirits and disease when we wassail. In the 16th century, wassailing boys were known as howlers, and wassailing as howling. Chinese firecrackers drive off bad energy and bring good luck. Medieval bells were holy and were baptised before being hung. They had a mystic potency, an ability to clean the air and drive away devils. As David Cressy says, in early modern England it was still a popular belief that the spirit world could be intimidated through noise. Bells were rung to fight off thunder and lightning. This is an inscription from a medieval bell. I praise the true God, call the people, assemble the clergy, toll for funerals, subdue the thunder flash, mourn the dead, drive away plague and beautify festival. We make seasonal noises, ships, horns and fireworks resound at New Year. In 1811, the Reverend William Holland described Whit Mundy in Nether Stowey. The town was very lively on top of Castle Hill was a glorious bonfire and music. 
They attempted squibs and crackers in the town, but old Mr. Symes, to my great surprise, ran after and collared one man and put a stop to it. But they had a cannon on top of the hill, which they fired often. Paul Hensner, in 1605, writes of this love of the noise of cannons, guns and fireworks. The British excel in dancing and music, for they are active and lively. They are vastly fond of great noises that fill the air, such as the firing of cannons, drums and the ringing of bells, so that it is common for a number of them, when drunk, to go over to some belfry and ring the bells for hours. William Gamage wrote a ballad about the summer games in Wells in Somerset in 1607. Drums, fifes and trumpets did sound apace. The countryside held no disgrace into our town to make resort to hear the cannon roar. The firing of anvils was often heard at 19th century town celebrations. In Taunton, at a festival celebrating the passing of the Great Reform Bill of 1832, 20 anvils were fired. Two anvils are used, one as a base, placed upside down, and the other one, known as the flyer, on top. The space between is filled with black powder. Anvils were traditionally fired on St Clement's Day, the patron saint of blacksmiths and metal workers, and still are in Mayfield in Essex. Whitmundy and Mayday have their own seasonal noise, wit horns and may horns, a tradition found in Whitney and Witchwood, in Penzance and Norfolk. Noise is one of the sounds of the topsy-turvy world of carnival. In Bruegel's painting of the battle between carnival and Lent, you can see the noisy instruments and rough music of carnival. Marina Warner in No Go, the Bogeyman, comments on this. Carnivals draw an excess, flourish, grimace and caricature to make their impact. They deploy giants, mannequins and masks, scarecrows and bugbears. They unfurl banners, wave placards, brandish staffs, explode fireworks, bangers, crackers, band rattles and drums. After the Reformation and the loss of over half of our festivals and feast days, the English developed a new festive calendar, often based around the monarch. They had a good rousing sermon, Bells, bonfires, guns, fireworks and plenty to drink. Bonfire night is the last of these celebrations. By the 19th century, it had become England's carnival night, literally so, in Bridgewater. This was a mischief night of disguise, noise, fires, squibs, effigy burning and misrule. By the late 19th century in Bridgewater, church bells were rung and bands played, including the Penny Awful Band, with tin whistles, kettle drums, pots and pans. At Ottery St Mary, before the flaming tar barrels hurtled down the streets, rock cannons are fired. Noise dries off bad luck and brings good luck at personal ceremonies. That's why we tie cans to the back of wedding cards. It's a remnant of the rough music that marked the ceremony. A rough music still heard in the Shivari, heard in the United States and Canada. In Dombey and Son, Dickens describes the wedding noise and the shenanigans that accompany it. The men who play the bells have got scent of the marriage. And the marrow bones and cleavers too, and a brass band. Marrow bones and cleavers were a butcher's tradition. Each cleaver was ground so it could ring. Often a complete band would consist of eight men with their cleavers so tuned. They would offer their services for marriage ceremonies and provide music until the requisite fee was forthcoming. If the services would decline, they would turn up anyway and make things very unpleasant. Marrow bones and cleavers were heard in parades, dances, hustings, rough musics and charades. On birthdays, we blow buzzers and horns again for good luck. 
At funerals, there were bells and fusillades. A special bell was once rung to mark someone's death, for whom the bell had told the death knell. In Pembrokeshire, trouncing was a funeral rough music at a wake to drive away evil spirits. Noise is the sound of protest, as in the beating of pots and pans in rough musics. A rough music is a community protest, also known as a skimmington, low belling, rustling, rantanning, and riding the stang. The word skimmington comes from the ladle used in Somerset cheese making and was first heard in riots against common land enclosures in the early 17th century. Rough music is the term generally used in England to denote a rude cacophony, with or without elaborate ritual, directing mockery or hostility against individuals who offended certain community norms. It was noted as the harmony of tinging kettles and frying pans in R. Cotrice's A Dictionary of the French and English Tongue in 1611. In the 18th century, it was often a misogynist ritual against what were regarded as assertive women. But by the 19th century, it railed against wife beatings, child abuse, uppity vicars, land enclosures, infidelity, and was used by strikers. Thomas Hardy describes the instruments of the rough music in the Mayor of Casterbridge. With the din of cleavers, tongs, tambourines, kits, crowds, humstrung serpents, ram's horns, and other historical kinds of music. But then pots and pans were bashed in the anti capitalist protests earlier this century. The casserole protests, or caseroloso, heard in South America, Canada, Spain, and Portugal. In fact, they were first recorded in 1971 in Chile against the shortages under Allende. But rough music is also a musical form, noise as comedy. At the court of James I and Charles I, rude music regularly featured in court entertainments as part of the satiric anti-mask. In Henry Curley's burlesque, Cronon Hoton Fologos, the stage directions read as follows. A concert of rough music, viz. salt box and rolling pins, gridirons and tongs, sow gelders' horns, marrow bones and cleavers, and co. He wakes. Cron. What heavenly sounds are those that charm my ears? Sure, tis the music of the tuneful spheres. In 1672, a grand London pageant displayed, in the midst of much else, several kitchen musicians that play upon tongs, gridirons, keys, and other such confused music. This recalled Big Joe Williams singing about kitchen music in his classic Shake, Rattle and Roll. Get out of that bed, wash your face and hands. Well, get into that kitchen, make some noise with the pots and pans. By the 18th century, rough music had become a burlesque genre in the pubs of London. An ode to St Celia's Day, adapted to the ancient British music, which was published in 1749 by Fustian Sackbutt, gives praise to those truly British instruments, the salt box, the Jew's harp, marrow bones and cleavers, and bladders and string. Mr Sackbutt's real name was Bonnell Thornton and he and the poet Christopher Smart often performed at the Ranley Pleasure Gardens. The salt box was literally that, a wooden box in which soup was held and you banged the lid. Rough musics were part of the Teddy Row ritual in Sherbourne on the eve of the pack fair. They were stopped in the 1960s, but you can still hear the tin can band playing at Braunton in North Hants before Christmas. The recent Thursday clap for carers had this rough music element too, as people bashed pots and pans and made other noises on their doorsteps. You can hear this delight in noise and sound in Ian Raw's book Honk, Conk and Squawk It a compendium of fabulous and forgotten sound words. 
In there, you find other words for rough musics, including badger band, choice riot, shalal, stock and horn. Other choice noise words include brattle, calithump, clanjandering, hammergag, rumpum and scrumpum. This comedy of noise continued into musical circus and clown. But noise was also a word for bands and music. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. In Tudor Exeter, it was the duty of the waits or civic musicians to attend to the mayor for the solacing of him and others with their noises and melodies. Don't sound your instruments a joy. An 18th century anthem tells us to sound, sound your instruments of joy. But noise is Janus edged. The cry of pleasure twists into the cry of pain and despair. The yell of triumph into the sob of grief and loss. Let's not forget the appalling din of war the pandemonium of the industrial machine, that noise can be a weapon. For the 17th century ranter, Abiza Cop, the noise of England was the noise of oppression. Mine ears are filled brimful with confused noise, cries and outcries. Oh, the innumerable complaints and groans that pierce my heart through and through. Oh, astonishing complaints. These, and diverse of the same nature, are the cries of England, and can I any longer forbear? Cop fled from the wrath of Parliament for proclaiming the worship of God in sex, swearing and drinking, for suggesting that God was a woman and that it was our moral duty to rob the rich. He was protected by the former minister of St Lawrence's in Reading, John Pordage. Pordage was presiding over a proto-commune in Bradfield. At his trial for blasphemy, when Pordage was accused of bringing the New Jerusalem down into his front room, he was judged by Mr Tinkle, Mr Bell and Mr Angel in a trial by noise. There have been many battles over the noise we make. There were Elizabethan laws against minstrels. When Parliament won the civil war against Charles I, a whole noisy celebratory culture was banned. In 19th century London, it was like Womad on the streets. They were full of German bands, French hurdy-gurdy players, Italian harpists and Ethiopian serenaders. In 1850, a number of prominent London-dwelling Victorians, including Charles Babbage and Dickens, argued for a bill against these street musicians and their foreign noise. Later in the century, the Skeleton Army noisily harried Salvation Army bands in a battle over drink and temperance. The army was often sponsored by brewers. And then, of course, the Criminal Justice and Public Order Act of 1994, prohibiting collective trespass and nuisance on land, included sections against sounds wholly or predominantly characterised by the emission of a succession of repetitive beats. So, noise is at the heart of our identity and of how we celebrate and protest. It summons good energies, drives away bad, and glories in its aliveness in the joy of noise. My own love of listening to the ferment and tumult of free improvisation comes from how it makes your whole body an organ of listening, tingling and alive to the change and flow of sound and noise. But as we've seen, noise is multifaceted. It can be liberating, it can be oppressive, polluting and cleansing. As the great historian of noise, Hillel Swartz says, timeless and untimely, noise is the noisiest of concepts, abundantly self-contradictory. 
Noise signals a loss of control. It breaks rules. That's why it's a key to the history of music in the 20th century. As Greg Hange comments, from Schoenberg to Stravinsky to Russello to Cage to Hendrix to Mertzbau, atonality, dissonance, feedback, distortion, glitch and various shades of noise have done their best to colour and discolour music. Today, we've created a tumult of new technologies to create noise and are surrounded and awash in a sea of noise, information and signals. But all this modern noise was predicted by Francis Bacon in his New Atlantis of 1627. We have sound houses where we practice and demonstrate all sounds and their generation. We have harmonies which you do not, of quarter sounds and lesser slides of sounds. We represent and imitate all articulate sounds and letters and the voices of beasts and birds. We also have diverse strange and artificial echoes reflecting the voice many times. We have also the means to convey sound in tubes and pipes in strange lines and distances. This podcast was brought to you by Tim Hill and The Sound of the Streets. The Sound of the Street is a project celebrating and promoting street bands, outdoor music and celebratory sound. We are putting on a festival in Taunton over the weekend of July the 8th, 9th and 10th, running education projects and creating other events in Somerset. The podcast was created with the help of funding from the Arts Council of England. Thank you.